Okie dokie. So, uh, next question. Uh, this comes in from George Bond about our, uh, our flume experiments. I had a discussion with an atheist who rejected and dismissed the flume experiments. He claimed that they are only models and not representative of real conditions. How does he think experiments are done? Care to comment? Uh, yes, you will find it's a interesting um, use of words that are meaningless. Okay, scientists work in models, right? But the models are supposed to be descriptions of reality to their best of their ability. So when you're dealing with atoms, are they little plum pudding things like Thompson thought? Uh, are they electrons spinning in S orbits and P orbits and things like that? Or even is that a model? Are they just there and they come and they go because they can transfer into different electronic states almost at will? All of those things are models. But your flume experiments go one step further. Your flume experiments are based on what actually is happening and then you are duplicating what's happening. So when you take a theory that says, um, you know, atoms can be pu pulled apart and the amount of energy holding them together is theoretically enormous. I mean, when Einstein got to that point and the others said, well, if we can pull it apart, the energy that will be released must be incredible. And hence the atom bomb. Now, the atom bomb is not a model the plum pudding view, view of the atom, the S orbital, P orbital, the conclusion that the energy holding these things together must be enormous. Is that a model? Well, you can easily run a test, blow up Hiroshima. It's a model that works, and so it approaches reality. So when you look at the flume experiments designed on the fact that in Venus, uh, not Venus, Venice, <laughs> uh, you have strata that show up the wrong way, according to Steno, and our friends set out to say, how do you actually get strata that don't go from bottom to top? They go from left to right. And then you design a mini copy. This is not a model. This is a copy of what's actually happening in the uh, Venus, in, in the Venice area. And then you find it applies to other areas. John Mackay, yours truly, has sat in the, you know, the tidal bores, Diane, where the oh, bay gets yes, thinner and thinner yeah. and the tide goes faster and faster. Mm. I actually rather foolishly decided to walk out into the Bay of Funday. Um, you know, Nova Scotia, it's got incredibly high 70 feet, uh, 20 metre tide rises. And I thought, I wonder what's actually out there when the tide gets low. So yours truly, being foolish as well as sometimes explorative geological, decided to walk out to the lowest tide level I could get. Now, the interesting thing is when you have tidal bores, you can surf on them. Uh, when you have tidal bores and the tide changes, it just doesn't creep in slowly. It had John McCoy running for crazy like, uh, like he had to, well, he did have to escape that incredible current that was coming in. But then I did it in reverse. I thought, I wonder what happens when these tidal bores get up to the tidal marshes. And the reality is, I saw layers forming horizontally. And then when they went out, I saw layers being eroded. And then I saw the solution to many puzzles. And you know what the puzzle was? I'd come across in Nova Scotia, not far away, reptile tracks, and they would come along a layer. You could excavate them. And then they would just disappear. And then another set of reptile tracks would show up in a couple of centimetres above and you scratch your head and say, they are the same reptile tracks. It almost looks like it's come along and jumped up. And, you know, as I sat in the tidal marshes there, yes, yours truly has done a lot of marsh sitting, a lot of swamp walking, a lot of exploring so that we're not dealing with models. And you know what I saw? The tide came in really rapidly. It would deposit a centimetre of mud in each tidal flow. So it didn't take long to build up a whole series of layers that were formed this way or that way. They all form sideways. And then one day as the tide went out, yes, I did this many, many days and watched what happens. There was a little birdie coming along and it was walking on one layer. But this layer was interesting because I'd seen it form the day before. And then as the tide came out, another centimetre formed on the way out. But what it did was it ripped off the layer below it. And there were bird footprints below, and there were bird footprints up there. 
and I watched the bird come along and jump, the same bird. And yet the geologist would say, these must be hundreds of years younger. No, <laughs> the same bird walking along as the different layers came. And I thought, that's it. All of those layers got there rapidly, rapidly and rapidly out. And that's why these, these um, uh, you know, flume experiments are not models. They are actually copies of what you see in the real world, which is a totally different thing. Don't be surprised. We do find models helpful, but models are no use unless you can get to a point of saying, look, we've now duplicated what happens in the real world. At that point, it passes from a model to a, a representation yes. of reality, yes. doesn't it? Yes. And in fact, that has happened at Jurassic Arc because we, we've got that uh, down the bottom where um, where the water flowed across uh, across our fossil bed. That's and, right, and uh, made those yes, tracks and made exactly layers, the same. That's and, right. and we we actually observed that flood. And for those of you who wonder what George is talking about, yes. uh, yesterday we did a session for uh, Standing for Truth, and uh, I'm really pleased with how it came out. Joe did a great job, even though he could be heard on that program. He's not got selective hearing. Uh, his program worked really brilliantly yesterday. But you can go to Standing for Truth and look at those uh, several hours, I think it was several hours we did, on strata experiments and experiments in the real world, not just models uh, like we do theoretically. So uh, have a look, George, and make sure that that stays up there. We'd encourage you, do the experiments yourself and see what your machinery actually produces. Water, it does not form from bottom to the top, or the layers don't form oldest at the bottom, youngest at the top. They form oldest at the start and youngest at the end. What a difference. And then you can cover it all up and say I've got a buried um, undercut valley and you'd be totally, absolutely wrong. In fact, let's show this video now and you can watch it happen yourself. So we have our sediment pouring in from one current. We have a fountain of the deep blasting up from underneath. You watch what happens when the two of them interact. In case you're not fast enough, you might actually like to note that the heavy particles end up usually on the top of the flows, not on the bottom. The bottle experiment simply is fake. Look how it sinks now. Sinks because it's totally saturated. The, exactly what you would have got in Noah's flood, which is purpose, what does Peter say? To catastrophize the world. It, it was cataclysmic. Wow. In fact, when you're looking at all of that sinking that's going on there, you would say this represents processes that took ages. Now, it took a couple of minutes while the video was running. And look, you're now going to fill in the whole valley. And, uh, well, I'm sure you've seen rift valleys like that. But in reality, they weren't rift valleys. They were motion that was produced simply by the water while all the other beds were soft. Well, let's move on to the next one now. Here's the result. Yep, I'm sure you can go to South Africa and find sediments like that. You can find them in America and see them on the islands off New Zealand where huge geysers of, of the material have popped up from underneath. Fantastic stuff. Water does not lay down beds horizontally. It's got nothing to do with time. It's got everything to do with process. And you need to build into your geologic thinking the scale of Noah's flood. Why? because it's not the evidence which contradicts the word of God. You see, geologists have a habit of ignoring God in everything, and it is deliberate.